Psalm step number 92. You can begin reading verse number 1. The psalmist writes, it's a, or it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, and to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Now, if you read the caption, or I forget what the, the proper name is for it, but the thing below Psalm 92, but before verse 1. There you go. Okay, It says, a psalm or song for the Sabbath day. The Jews at this time, they worshipped on the Sabbath day. That was Saturday. Okay, this song, or psalm, was meant to only be sung on the days that they went and worshipped in the house of God. Right now, one of the beauties is we got songbooks. We got more songs in there than people in this building know. Right? Every now and then, somebody throws us a curveball and sings one that nobody's ever heard before, and then the piano player's like, well, it says it's supposed to go like this, and Brother Clint's like, well, I don't remember it going like that. And then it's always just fun for everybody. Right? But this psalm, right, we've got songbooks. You can hum Amazing Grace to yourself whenever you want to. Right? But this psalm, keep in mind the priest at the time, or King David or whoever it was that wrote this psalm, right, this was a psalm meant to be sung at the house of God. This was a song that was put to music that the priest would play the music for. In other words, the best instrument players that the kingdom had would learn how to play this song. Okay, the best singers at the time that they had would learn this song. And it was designated to be sung only at the house of God on the Sabbath day. Right, this was a song that they would sing not for people. They sang this song for God. This wasn't a psalm to make you feel better. This was a psalm that they preserved and reserved only for God to hear on the days that God rested, the Sabbath day, as a song of worship and praise unto God. Right, there are songs that you could sing, and it's supposed, you know, it might pick you up. It might put a little pep in your step. That right, might remind you of what God's done for you. This song was to show God how much they appreciated what God had already done. This wasn't a song that was... You know, how can I say this? This wasn't a song to be sung. This was a song to be performed unto God. This wasn't something that you just sing around your house. No, you put on your best clothes when you sang this song. Right? You made sure that all the stray phrase of, you know, string and yarn and everything, you inspected your outfit before you went into the house of God and sang this song. Because not everybody can go into the house of God. Only the priest. Right? There are certain people that in this dispensation that go their entire lives without seeing the most holy of holies. Because only the high priest could go in there and only once a year. Right? There are certain people that would step into the outer court of the temple, but they'd never be able to ascend those steps and enter into the actual house of God. Some would go in just to put showbread down on the table. Some would go in just to light the incense or to make sure that the lantern or the lamp, which nowadays they call menorah, was lit and that the flame did not go out. This song was a duty. Right? You had to perform it a certain way because it wasn't being performed unto man. It was being performed unto God. Right Now, that's the same mindset, by the way, that we should have when we get up and we sing songs in church today. The song's not to make me feel better. No, this is a representation of how I feel towards God. This is an outward manifestation of what's going on deep down in here. But this song, you couldn't just start singing it on Monday, or even in that time, you couldn't sing it on Sunday. No, this was a song that was reserved for the Lord's Day. This was a song that was reserved for the day that people were supposed to go back and give their best unto God. You know why people didn't work on the Sabbath day? One, out of 
honor that God created everything in six days and rested on the Sabbath, but also because that was the day that they were to give back to God. Sunday through Friday in their calendar, it was all about heaping unto themselves what they could. They'd go out and they would work as hard as they could, make sure that they'd have a harvest. But see, on Saturday, it's not about what I get, it's about giving unto God. Now we celebrate on Sundays because that's the day Jesus got up out of the grave. You know what Sunday's supposed to still represent? Monday through Saturday's the time that God gives unto me. Sunday, that's his time. That's his day. I don't call the shots on Sunday. I don't call the shots any day of the week. Right? But Sundays isn't my day. It's not a day where I decide what I get to. No, no, no. Sunday is the Lord's day. Right? Well, with that mindset, they broke this psalm just for the Lord's day. This was a song to be sung the best that they could with the best instruments that they had. Look at verse number three upon an instrument of ten strings. Okay, you know what that is now? Well, it could have been a harp. Okay, ten string harp, really big one. Okay, like a bass only without four strings that had ten. Okay, could also be on an instrument of ten strings like a guitar. Okay, or a lute would have been closer to it but it's got 10 strings how many fingers y'all got yeah but that's just to pluck it how do you keep it in tune right how do you change the pitch of each string you gotta be talented to play something that's got as many strings as it, you know you got fingers okay you want another thing that makes a piano difficult it's got 88 keys and you only got 10 fingers now you want to know what makes a guitar Hard to play. Well, I've got five fingers and there's six strings. And then I got six strings over here that I've got to fret. You know, if you're good, you can use 12 of them. Okay, anything above the double dot, you got to be Eddie Van Halen to, in order to use them things. Right? But the thing that makes instruments hard to play is that it takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of coordination. Right? You may be able to get up and pick out hot cross buns on a piano. Okay, might be able to play chopsticks, right? Like that Tom Hanks movie where he plays it on a big piano with his feet. Right, well, you might be able to do that, but we're talking about playing a song unto God on the Lord's Day. They would practice from Sunday to Friday with nobody listening, just to make sure that they could play it as good as they could when it came to the Lord's Day. That's as an instrument, ten string, psaltery. Right, upon the harp with a solemn sound. Right, You weren't hitting any high notes to impress the people that were listening. No, you were playing the melody that had been put out by the chief musician and you were playing it with a solemn sound. Now, solemn doesn't mean that it's dreary, but solemn means that it's not about flourishes it's not about impressing the people that are listening to it with how good you can play your instrument. No, you're playing the notes that you're supposed to play because that's what you believe God wants to hear. A solemn sound. Not dreary, not draggy, it's not funeral music. But you're not doing it. I mean, this is a happy psalm. This is a psalm of praise. That don't go too well with a beat that, you know, Eeyore would have liked. Right, but notice he says it's all stringed instruments. There's no drums, there's no cymbals. This is a solemn. This isn't about making a loud noise, it's about making the right noise. Okay, we're going somewhere with all this. Just stick with me. But we get back to verse number one. He says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. He says it's a good thing to do, not just two different ways. It's good to give praise unto the Lord because the Lord deserves it. It's always a good thing to do the right thing. God is holy. Right? God deserves praise. It's a good thing to give God the praise that He deserves. We can go and study it out that the rocks will cry out in your place if you don't praise and worship and honor God in your daily life. If you don't praise God, God will find somebody to replace you. It's a good thing for you to do it on your own. Right? But it's a good thing to praise the Lord because by praising the Lord, you remember what God's already done for you. It's a good thing to sit and reflect upon what God has already done for you. 
You can't praise if there's nothing that you've got worth praising in your life. If you're not thinking about what God's done for you, you're not going to praise Him. It's a good thing to praise God because you get your mind back focused upon what's important in your life. That's the relationship between you and God. It's a good thing to praise or to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto that name. Well, hang on, we, we just changed gears. It's a good thing to give thanks. It's a good thing to openly acknowledge or privately in your prayer closet to acknowledge, Lord, thank you for doing this. Lord, thank you for doing this. Lord, I just want to you know, do my best, even though he knows your heart. Man looking on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. But it does something. doesn't make sense to me why it would do something for me to give thanks unto God. But there's something that God appreciates and finds favor in when I do my best to just open up my heart and go through the process of explaining to God why I give the thanks that I'm given. On why it meant so much to me that a holy God would do something for somebody that he found in the off scour of the world, but yet that he chose to do it anyway. Well, then it says, and to sing praises unto thy name. Now, see, singing and giving thanks are two different things. You can do both at the same time, but you can give thanks anywhere. In order to sing, that's more practice. You don't just get up and sing a song you've never heard before. You certainly, in this day and age, if you were the one that was writing the song, you don't just scribble something down and start singing it. It takes much effort. It takes not just the effort of learning it, then you've got to make sure that every time you sing it, it sounds the way that it was supposed to sound. Now, I don't know about you guys. We'll pick on Miss Rhonda. Miss Rhonda, I don't know about you, Miss Rhonda. But if you've got somebody like, oh, I don't know, named Doug Foster, that is known to, out of the blue, just say, I want my family to come up and sing. And then we ask him, well, what song you want us to sing? And then he names one that he can't even remember the name of the song, and we've got to decipher it based off of what he just gave us. And then it's a song we haven't sang in about 10 years, okay? I don't think I remember how that one goes. And then Sydney or Christian will look at me and say, uh, all right, we'll try it. We'll see how this goes. Right? Or mom, we look at mom and we're like, have we ever sang this before? And she's like, oh. Right? You may have once known the song. But if somebody says, hey, sing that song you used to sing about 20 years ago. I, I don't know that one no more. It's like, I, I, I know the name. I don't know the song. Well, it's a good thing to give thanks unto God but and to sing praises unto thy name. In order to sing praises, you've got to make sure that you remember the tune. You remember the song. But not just that. Then you add on top of that that you've got to, when you perform it under the Lord, you're not getting up to sing it to hit all the right notes. You're singing it as an outward representation of what's going on down here. So you've got to have both of them down to where it, you've got to be, you've got the right key and you're in the right pitch. But then while you're singing, it's not, I'm not thinking about whether I'm hitting the right note. That's already just muscle memory. What I'm thinking about is with those words reflecting from my heart towards God what it is that I feel on the inside. Well, it's a good thing to sing praises unto his name. Why? Because of the last part. Oh, most high. That high is capitalized. That's a name of God. Right? He is high. Why? Because his throne's on the sides of the north. Everything's below him. He's the most high. Just a part of who he is. God had to lower himself to come to us because he's so high. When Christ put on a robe of flesh, he had to take a big step down to, for us. That, well, verse number two. Here's why it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto God. Here's the purpose of both of them. It says, to show forth thy loving kindness. 
Now that word show means to make a outward representation of. Okay, I cannot put on a plate and then show it to you the Lord's loving kindness. It is not a thing, it is an act. God shows forth his loving kindness. He's not just kind, he's also loving, which is why it's a kindness given in love. Loving kindness. But to show forth unto others the loving kindness that God has shown to me, you've got to go through a little bit of a detail, a little bit of a story. You've got to convey to people where you were, what you were going through, what God did for you, and why, in your eyes, it was a great act of loving kindness for God. Go read those psalms that David wrote. Read those little captions at the beginning of the chapter. The psalm that David wrote when he was in a cave fleeing for his life because Saul had promised to kill him. Or a psalm that was written right, to represent what he felt down there at Ziklag when everybody betrayed him. Everybody wanted to kill him. Right, that puts into context the words of that psalm because you can understand where the person that wrote it was. You ever wonder why those little captions are there at the beginning of your song? Because in order to understand the loving kindness that God showed to them, you've got to understand where they were in their life. We know that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Right? We say it. But when it comes to praising God, it's not about just saying how good God Everybody knows God is good. He is goodness. He is love. It's just a part of who he is. But see, we're talking about giving praise under the name of God. We're talking about singing songs unto God for the express purpose of showing others how good God's been to us. But when there was a whole lot of it this week during revival, but when anybody got something on their heart and then they don't get time to raise a hand they've already jumped up because God's you know about doing somersaults down in here in their soul they can't contain it no more right the ones that God's put a touch on them they're real good at saying about how whatever God did for them they didn't deserve it and how all the glory goes to God because nobody else could have done it except God the whole purpose of a true testimony is that God's not just good. God's been good to me, and here's why. It is specific. If God hasn't done something specific for you, you cannot be specifically thankful for it. To give praise or to sing songs of worship unto God. Now, the Bible says that if anybody with two brain cells would take a look around, they'd be without excuse not to praise and worship God to know that God was their creator and also to know that God being our creator is holy and that we are not holy we just summed up a lot of Bible right there but that's what the Bible does teach but see it's one thing to know that somebody's holy it's another thing to know that somebody holy did something for somebody that was not holy when it says to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning you know what that means there's praise for the morning, there's praise for the afternoon, there's praise for the evening. It's always timely to praise God in the right manner. It don't matter what time it is, as long as you've got the right spirit, it's always a good thing to praise and worship God. But it says to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. We see a contrast of times here. In the morning... You've still got to face the rest of your day. So the psalmist says, it's always right. Keep in mind, they'd sing this on the Sabbath day. This is a reminder unto them that God tomorrow is the same God that he was today, and he's the same God today that he was yesterday. So in the morning, they get up, and it says, to show forth his loving kindness in the morning first thought the psalmist is saying 
The first thought on your head every day should be that the love and kindness of God has not been exhausted. We get up and we put our mind, we start praising, thanking God, singing songs towards God that show forth, well that means that tells everybody around us that God is loving and He is kind and He shows forth loving kindness. You know what that does? That puts into puts you into remembrance but it also puts all those around you into remembrance that the God of yesterday the one that said that he loved you that he'd never leave you nor forsake you the one that said that he loved you so much that he sent his son for the one that the son said that when he left the comforter would come because God loves you so much that he wanted you to have a companion to lead you and guide you into all truth the one that has loved you with an everlasting love. The one that told Job he knew him before he formed him in the belly. The one that has known you from the alpha of time until the omega of time. That God loves you. And out of that love, he shows kindness to you. You know what another word for love and kindness is? Mercy. You know what another word for love and kindness is? Grace. You know what love and kindness can be summed up with? The psalmist wrote it this way. Daily he loadeth us with benefits. God's love and kindness is the reason that God didn't just save us and leave us where we were. God loved you, that's why he wanted to save you. But because he loved you enough to save you, he also loved you enough to change you and to make you into something new. And then he promised to meet all your needs because he being your father would not see you in one. But then he also gives us that verse that says that if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, all these things be added unto you. We got more than we need. We got more than we could even want. In fact, if we want something that we don't have, that's just the flesh rearing its head up. I believe I could show you Bible on that. That's just the flesh wanting more. But if we sit down and we think about the loving kindness of God, we're without excuses to say, hey, Lord, you've already given me more than I could ever want, could ever deserve. He says, in the morning we talk about the loving kindness of God. Because if we think back about all them times when it got real bad, and out of the loving kindness of God, he made a way, or he provided what it was that we needed. Or even though we didn't deserve it, even though we didn't need it, God just gave some handfuls of purpose our direction because he just wanted to be good to us. If you start off the day thinking about God's loving kindness throughout the day, you're going to be reminded that no matter what comes your way, God's always been good before. He says we start off the day talking about God's loving kindness because if we remember in the morning that God has shown forth too much loving kindness for us to be anything but certain that He loves us, that He wants the best for us. God couldn't have treated me the way that he did yesterday if he didn't want the best in my life. Even on the days that God chastises me, he does it out of loving kindness because he wants the best for me. He wants to see me be what I can be in his son. He doesn't want the flesh getting in the way. He wants the spirit to be able to enter into that perfect law of liberty, to grow and transform into that new creature that he started on the day that he saved me. Even chastisement's done out of love. Correction is given in kindness. Why? Because he loves us. He says, start off the day remembering how good God's been to you through love and kindness. Praise forth his love and kindness. And you know what's going to be on your mind throughout the rest of the day? Regardless of what comes my way, God's love and kindness is bigger than whatever I'm about ready to face. If it enters my life, it's because God has ordained it. He's allowed it to happen. And if it enters my life, it's for my betterment. Either for God to do something for me that I cannot do for myself, or as a challenge for me to put into practice those things that God's already instilled in me. God doesn't put on us more than we can bear. You know what? Loving kindness. We may put more on ourselves than we're able to bear, but that's a different lesson. But God has promised that every temptation there's a way of escape. That His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Anything that God allows to come into our life 
is meant to show forth what God has done for us. May not be easy, but God's still loving and He's still kind. And even in my hardness, remember we started the day, praise the Lord. Well, it was real dark one time, but God's love and kindness showed up. I remember a time when I thought it was as dark as it could get. And God still showed up, and with love and kindness, He ministered unto me. Right? He gave me that balm of Gilead. He put on me that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. All out of love and kindness. And you know what I realized? No matter how dark it gets, God's brighter in the dark. Well, what's that do for you when later on that day you meet a little bit of dark again? Ah, I remember that. That's dark. You know what happened the last time I was in dark? God showed up and showed me love and kindness. So even though this may be hard, even though we're about ready to go through a storm, I know that God's loving kindness is going to be able to reach me here just like it reached me yesterday. He says we praise Him for His loving kindness in the morning to remind us that for the rest of the day, God's still loving and God's still kind. We praise Him because He deserves it. But if you just go about talking about how good God is in the morning, regardless of what you face the rest of that day, you remember that God's still going to be able to be good through all of that. The praise is for God. It's not for us. But by praising Him, we get our mind thinking back because, again, you've got to praise Him from here. can't praise Him from here or praise Him from here. Those are just words. That's just memory things that you've, you know, memorized before which is a good thing to do because that means that these words reflect what you feel down on the inside but you still got to praise Him still got to worship Him still got to sing to Him from your heart so when you get to in the morning praising God singing songs about God but in your heart you're remembering how you felt you were so down you were so low but yet God's loving kindness came in and just you know as the psalmist said his children shall mount up on wings as eagles. You thought you was dead down in the valley and God just sent a breeze by your way, slapped a set of wings on your back, and next thing you know, you're soaring. Looking at where you used to be down in there, well, how in the world did we get out of there? We didn't. God's love and kindness lifted us out of it. If you start thinking about what it was that you felt when you were low, and then you remember what it felt like when God came by your way, and that loving kindness just started to be shown in your direction. God always loves you and God's always kind, but every now and then He just dumps it out on you. And if you remember what that feels like, you start worshiping and praising God, then the next time you encounter low, you're going to remember God's got loving kindness brighter than this darkness. God's got loving kindness stronger than whatever it is that I'm facing. God's got loving kindness that goes beyond what I can even ask or think. And if I have to go through this darkness to experience more of God's loving kindness, God's loving kindness is worth it. I won't quit on Him. I won't back down. Why? Because He's the Most High. I'd rather be close to the Most High than anything down here in the world. The Bible says that the world's His footstool. Everything down here on earth, it's under God's feet. I'd rather be sticking with the high stuff. Everything on earth, right, is a blacktop to God. It's just a footstool. Right, when was the last time you thought about, oh man, this blacktop is so valuable? No, it's just, just asphalt. Right, it's rock and tar mixed together. And it's so good that every now and then you're going to have to have it resealed. Because no matter how good the blacktop is, it's not permanent. Right? Well, you know what God's loving kindness is? Tire. Because it comes from the Most High. You start praising God's loving kindness in the morning, your aspirations are set far above this earth. It puts your spiritual goals, it puts your mindset where? In heavenly places. And where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. If you start thinking about the things that are lower, all of the things that are important to you are going to be laid up in this world. That means when darkness comes, you're looking to those things to give you loving kindness. You're going to go bankrupt waiting on things to make you happy. Right? Well, also it says, and thy faithfulness every night. 
every morning you wake up talking about the love and kindness of God you know what you're saying because God was faithful yesterday God's going to be faithful today and you know what you say at the end of the day I knew God was going to be faithful but because he's God he was more faithful than I thought he was going to be we say that we know that God's faithful but in truth we don't know how faithful God is until God shows up and shows us that he's faithful in more situations until we show up and we experience something that we haven't experienced before but guess what God's still there we know that God is faithful but every now and then we don't think that God can be faithful where we're at he was there yesterday but I've never been here before but just talk about his loving kindness in the morning and you're going to find out well yesterday I went someplace that I'd never been before God was still there David said it this way I can ascend up into the heaven I can find my soul in hell yet God's still there you know what he's saying God's always faithful it don't matter where I go God's promised that he's going to be with me which means even if I go into hell God's still going to be there with me because he promised to be he was talking about the grave by the way Old Testament hell, Sheol in Hebrew he says it don't matter where I go God's promised to be there well it's one thing to say that it's another thing to remember that I went someplace today that I didn't go before and let me tell you God's faithfulness it didn't run out when I hit there even if I faced the same thing over and over again God didn't let me face it on my own no he was still faithful to be there with me because I know that the arm of flesh will fail me I know that if I think I stand I need to take heed lest I fall I'm very needy but God was still very faithful today see in the morning you're praising him for what he did yesterday and how by faith you believe he's going to do it again today but in the evening you're thanking God for doing the thing that by faith you believed he was going to do did God not say that come unto me and I will no wise cast ye out did he not say to cast all our cares upon him because he careth for us did he not say that well Apostle Paul wrote don't have that Hebrew says okay that Jesus was made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek okay could be the apostle Paul could, couldn't be the apostle Paul anyway God said Jesus our faithful high priest seated at the right hand of the father there's so much that God does for you every second of every day that you don't even understand that it's important to take note when he shows up and proves to you how faithful he is even if it's the same faithfulness that he gave you how many of us can't be relied upon to do the exact same thing tomorrow that we did today right I'm frail I could get sick may not be able to do it for you tomorrow right? I may just be sorry and decide I don't want to do it tomorrow it may be that I go to do it but because something happens I can't finish it maybe that the project was a little bit more than I thought I was taking a bite out of and it was more than I could chew we got to come back and finish it the day after but if God said he was going to do it he's going to do it the exact same way tomorrow that he did it today God's faithfulness is not man's faithfulness man thinks of faithfulness as you know who you are as a person Right? if that person's faithful it means that they're the same they got the same spirit they always sit in the same spot they always give the same amount of money right? that's not faithfulness according to God faithfulness is not based off of who you are although God is God which means he's altogether lovely God's faithfulness is dependent upon results every time regardless of what you face you know what the result is when God steps in satisfied he's more than enough you know what God's faithfulness is measured in every time doesn't matter what situation doesn't matter where it was doesn't matter when it was doesn't matter how many times he's had to do it every time he shows up it's the exact same result satisfied taken care of nothing left wanting doesn't matter what God had to do he left the situation the exact same 
He's always been enough. Our definition of faithfulness, well, they may have showed up and given it just as much effort as they did yesterday, but they weren't able to finish the job. But that person's still faithful. I believe they're going to come back tomorrow. Well, I believe God's going to come back tomorrow because he's already in tomorrow. God can't leave a place that he's already at. Okay, but faithfulness, according to man, is I believe they'll be back tomorrow. God's going to be there tomorrow. But God's faithfulness is that tomorrow he's going to leave you just as satisfied as he did today. God has never delivered anything less than satisfaction. That means he kept you where you needed to be or he moved you to where you needed to be. There's a whole bunch of different things that God does, but at the end of the day, God's faithfulness is that God always does things well. His ways are above our ways. I can't understand how he does it. But God's faithfulness means that I'm not, I may not get the same result every day. I may not lay my head down to sleep in the same place that I woke up that day. I may not face the same problems that I did throughout the day, and God may not answer the same problem that I had yesterday the same way that he did yesterday. But God's faithfulness is that however God chooses to do it, it's always perfect. I'm satisfied. I may not understand all that goes into what God has to do in order to meet my needs every day. Or when I call on Him, how He chooses to respond. How He chooses to intervene on my behalf. I don't need to understand. All I need to know is that when God does it, it's just right. I'm satisfied. You know what satisfied means is? No complaints. I'm not missing anything. Nothing was done outside of you know, what I thought was going to be acceptable. No, because God does it according to God's standards, which are always more than enough for me. The faithfulness that they're talking about is not that God was there again that day. No, they're saying God showed up today just like he did yesterday. Everything was satisfactory. Instead of more complaint, all I can do is praise him for how good God handled things today. In fact, they start thinking about how faithful God was that day. By the time they wake up in the morning, you know what they're ready to sing praises about? God's loving kindness. They start every day off with, well, Lord, I can't believe how good you were to me yesterday. But I believe that today, because you're the same God, I believe that things are going to pan out the exact same way. I don't know what we've got to face, but I know God's going to be there to face it with me. So that by the time the evening rolls around, you know what they're saying? Man, God sure was faithful today. I didn't know that I was going to have to face that, but God handled that the same way that he always has, took care of it in just the right way. I'm satisfied. Look at verse number 4. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. Remember a minute ago when I said things aren't going to make you happy? You know what can make you happy? God. More importantly, the work of God. When it says, Thou hast made me glad through thy work, that means what God has already done. Lord, I'm happy not because of what I'm looking forward to. Lord, I'm not made glad by the fact that I did something with my hands today that I thought was pretty impressive. Oh no. Lord, I'm made glad by looking back and seeing your handiwork throughout my life. Even if today is the worst day that I've ever had, if God were to break fellowship with me, which is impossible because he promised not to, and it's impossible for God to lie, but if he were from this day forward to leave me alone to my own devices, because of what God's already done for me, I'm glad in the work that God has done. You know what makes me glad? It's not looking forward to what I'm going to have at the end of the day. I can look back and see what God has already done and be glad. Because I know where he found me and where I'm at now and we're faring a whole lot better than we deserve. But it says, I will be glad in thy work. Work is not just what's already done, it's what God's continuing to do. You know what Jesus promised? He said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He's still working. But how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because he hadn't come back to get us yet. Because when it's finished, he said he's coming back to get us. He's gone to prepare a place. I can be glad in the work 
that he's doing right now. I can be glad in the work, not just of the future, the work of the present. You know why we're here today? Because God's still working in people's lives. You know what hardship in my life means? God's still up to something. Because if it wasn't, what's the point of hardship? If God didn't have a purpose for it, it wouldn't enter into your life. God doesn't just let you experience hardship because he's evil. Right? Or he's got, you know, ulterior motives. Or he wants to see you suffer. No. Hardship is for the work that we hitched our wagon to when we got saved. Hardship shows forth the true value of what God put in us. So hardship means he's up to something. I may not like what I'm at right now, but I can, I can be glad in the work of God knowing that he's not done. Hardship isn't the end of it. The end is that I get to see what he's been working on the whole time. One of the beauties of heaven is that God's going to be able to go back and say, you remember this day? Yes, Lord, is all I could do to get through it. You had to help me a whole lot that day. Well, because of what you went through, that person saw what you were going through and somebody had handed them a track earlier that week. They knew that you were a Christian. They said, that person's got something that I don't. Because of that track, they went to church with the person that gave it to them. Or because you skipped a meal that week because God touched your heart to give a little bit more money to missions. These people got into heaven. I understand that in the short term it's real easy to focus on the hardships but I can be glad in the work of God knowing that the hardships are for a reason it's a real bad day today well that means God's cooking up something real good I've seen what he's done before it's always turned out good I've seen what by faith through the book of Revelation I've seen what he's going to prepare is going to be real good that means whatever he's cooking up right here is going to be just as good. We can be glad if not in our situation, in our current location. If not, based off of our current emotions. You know what we can be glad in? That God's always working. And the work of God always comes out the way that God intended it to. God did real good yesterday. They did real good the day before that. The work that God has always done has always been good. The work of yesterday was to lay the foundation for me to continue to go on today. The work of today is to make sure that others can go on tomorrow. The work of God is something that you can be glad in, even if your life's in your eyes falling apart. Knowing that the God that has done the works that He's done in the past still has you in his hand you can take solace in the fact that God's still working in your life too even when the work is painful to us I know that in the long term it's going to be something to be glad over but then he says also I will triumph in the works of thy hands glad is an emotion when you feel bad there are some things that can make you feel glad but triumph is a state of living. Y'all ever hear anybody teach on victorious Christian living? Right? Symbolically, through the Old Testament, that's when the Israelites left the wilderness and entered into Canaan land. They were living in the place that God had promised for them to live in, and they had finally received what it was that God promised to Abraham all them generations ago. And they were God's chosen people in God's chosen place. And as a result of it, God blessed them greatly. That's a sign of victorious Christian living. But triumph, by definition, means you overcome. You have conquered. Triumph means that what was set before you, God has put underneath of you, below your feet. But what's it say that we triumph in? The works of thy hands. The works of the hand of God. When you start to think about how glad you are for what God has worked in the past, you know what will cause you to triumph every day? Not what you can do. Not based off of what your hands are capable of holding on to or laboring in or building. Oh no, we shall triumph 
in the works of the hand of God. Why? Because we start praising Him in the morning. We start thinking about the works that God's done before, what He did yesterday, what we believe He's going to do today. It doesn't matter what comes into your life. It may be hard. It may hurt. It may be painful. It may everything but kill you. But you can triumph in the fact knowing that God wouldn't let it happen without a reason. You can be in a place and then there are times that a place has you. You can be going through something and then other times something has a hold on you. You know what the difference is? Where your sight is, where your faith is, where your focus is. You know the difference between walking on the waves with Him and then sinking and crying out for help? It's all about verse number 4. Lord, Thou hast made me glad with Thy work, and I will triumph in the works of Thy hands. Lord, I can conquer what's going on in my life today, not because I'm strong enough to, but because of what You did yesterday. Because of what I believe you're doing today. Lord, I can't triumph on my own account. But I know that with the blood of Jesus, I've been bought. And I'm in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand. Whatever's come into my life today has gone through God's seal of approval twice in order to get to me. And you know what that means? God's got a purpose for it. God's purpose is never to bring detriment to me, it's to make me better to improve me. So Lord, I can triumph in the fact that today's pain is for a reason. It's to make me more like Christ. Today's hardship is to bring forth out of me more of the fruit of the Spirit, to make me more into the image of Your Son. I can triumph in the fact that the reason I'm going through what I'm going through today is because God didn't finish with me. Because God is going to make me into something more like Himself. When you understand that, you can triumph. You may be walking around with a limp. You may have had a few teeth knocked out. But it is better to enter in the kingdom of heaven, halt and maim. You may look real rough to the world, but you can triumph over everything in the world. Because you're not looking at what's going on in you. You're looking at it from God's perspective. I can triumph knowing that God's still got His hand on me. God still knows just where I am. And because of those two things, because I believe in the work that He's done, that He's doing, and that He will do, I can look at today and say, even at its hardest, doesn't compare to Calvary. Because of what he's already done for me, I can overcome this. He's not a cruel taskmaster. I'm able to bear it. it may be hard, but I'm able to do it. And you can triumph over the things in your life rather than being put under bondage by them. You know why most people don't live victoriously? They forget about what God did for them yesterday and they're trying to face everything in their life today on their own. Oh no. If you're in that spot, you're in trouble. Because you're not enough. But He is. And you can triumph when you realize that all I have to take responsibility for is what God told me to handle. Because He promised to take care of the rest. There's triumph in knowing that God's fighting 99.99999% of your battle. And all he's asking you to take care of is what you can handle. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.